This week, we'll be talking a little bit about system security with a man whose code name writes itself. Thomas Weeks, or Tweaks, has loads of adventures in cyber to share with us. How are you doing, Thomas? Pretty good. Thank you for having me, Jen. Thomas, um, let's get this jump right into it. What is your job title? So um, I'm a I guess you could say a cloud engineer. I mean, my official job title at Virginia Tech is uh, the director of future technologies and communities. But uh, I spend most of my time sitting here with the, uh, the cyber range as a consulting engineer. So I work on uh, cloud engineering problems and uh, in relation to the cyber range. So tell us about your path to this field, because I know you started with electro engineering in high school, and it just kind of seems like this is a far way away from electrical engineering, if you know what I mean. Yeah, kind of, sort of, but um, kind of birds of a feather. Um, <laughs> so I lo always loved electronics as a youth and in junior high and got in, went to a technical high school, took electronics for three years, went directly into junior college, electrical engineering technologies, then transferred to Texas A&M and finished out my degree. Never changed a major, so always knew what I wanted to do. But along the way, um, I took uh, um, in, uh, at university. I took uh, a specialized in telecommunications. I, I loved computers. Did computers on the side, and um, eventually, kind of comp doing computers kind of became my main thing. I was big into the BBS scene in the '80s and um, and the hacking mag magazines in the in the '90s, and um, kind of loved security, and kind of got sucked into IT um, as the main kind of main way I got into security, kind of unofficially. Once you get into IT, you find you have to keep all your systems secure. And I really love doing that. And I uh, worked for the DOD and Rackspace and other folks who, uh, um, who would have me uh, secure systems. So what does it mean to like secure the systems or harden a network system? Like how do you go about, you know, doing that? And you particularly, you're at the Virginia cyber range. Like what does that mean specifically for what you do there? Well, um, what I do here is a little bit different than what I would do for a corporation for hardening systems. But the general concept is you harden in layers. Um, I, I like to tell people um, uh, so, uh, network or security rather in general, security is like uh, layers. It's best when it's applied in layers like an onion. And just like an onion, the deeper you get into it, the more it makes you cry, basically. <laughs> so, uh, but the but but the, the the point there is being you address things at the network layer, at the uh, and then your devices, your the outer layer of your devices, then the services layer of your devices, then the file system and permissions, all the way down to the user and data on the file system. So, um, you have to do it at all levels because you can't just rely on a firewall, for example. If you have a vulnerable web server, they're going to drill right through your firewall and penetrate your web server, and then you're owned. So you have to do it in layers. So um, now, now, now for for doing things here at the cyber range, yeah, um, our infrastructure is a, little, is a little different. It's all cloud-based. In fact, our entire front end and and our even our website is serverless. There's just, there's no there's no physical or even virtual machines involved. It's all what's called uh, lambdas or API calls um, to AWS systems that are all um, decentralized and load balanced. So hardening those systems is a little bit different, um, but the virtual machines inside the cyber range that people log into and actually use are actual VMs and those are restricted. So each one of these virtual machines that students use, they are quarantined off into their own little network bubble that they can't get out of or and do any damage to anybody else on the range or off the range on the internet. So uh, uh, hardening and some systems we purposely don't harden on the cyber range because they're targets, they're hacker targets. And so we teach the students how to attack and then how to defend, how to patch, how to make things secure. So hardening happens at the network layers and at the operating systems and services layers themselves. So in trying to, I guess, describe to people what a cyber range is who may not have heard, um, I was thinking about this, like one of my close friends, she used to work for a guy whose business was um, developing models of legs which at first I thought was kind of weird, but then, you know, you looked at them, they look like real legs and they were for surgeons, you know, to cut and practice on. And, you know, many people may be more familiar with like mannequins that we practice CPR with. So it's really common, you know, in the medical community to not use real people. <laughs> Cadab cadavers, yeah. 
Yeah. Or, you know, for various types of training, uh, well, minus the cadavers, but yes, like there, <laughs> there are only so many cadavers that can be available yeah, yeah. to everybody. You know, it's got to be affordable too. How is a cyber range similar in that regard? Well, um, in the same way, um, you want to practice. Okay, just, just like doctors have a practice. They call it a practice because they're practicing. <laughs> At least it's the doctors I talk to like to say. But the, uh, um, in the same way, uh, you don't want to be learning um, in the middle of a hack, a, 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 an incident, a hacker attack or an incident, a security incident. Um, so, and just like uh, I like to tell people, uh, you know, parents, sometimes um, people who are new to the concept of, of the cyber range and cybersecurity, teaching kids cybersecurity are afraid and dismayed that why are you teaching kids how to hack? Oh my gosh, that's, right. that's terrible. It's like, no, first of all, we cover ethics. We talk about what you should and shouldn't be doing, what's acceptable, unacceptable. And then we get into the hacker tools in the same way that a football team has to learn uh, all, both offense and defense to play the full game, to be a good team. Right. Um, and, and just like I like to tell kids, Harry Potter, the defense against the dark arts class. They take that class to learn the bad tools so that the kids can uh, learn to defend and uh, um, take care of uh, their own systems. And the cyber range, the, the term range, of course, is a safe place to play with dangerous things. So that's just, that's just the environment in which we do it. Well, and talking about the cyber range, um, I know this month that the Virginia Cyber Range is hosting the Commonwealth uh, Cyber Cup, mm -hmm. right? Um, which is a CTF challenge that's really just available to Virginia schools. And a mm -hmm. lot of kids, I'm sure, and maybe teachers are like, wow, this is cool. Why can't the other states compete? <laughs> right, right. Well, in, in this specific case, um, the Virginia Cyber Range was brought into existence through Virginia legislatures, the leg legislature using Virginia taxpayers' money. Um, so that's the main reason. Um, but after we had launched back in um, back in 2016, um, and we became very popular through 2017 and 18, um, we had a lot of requests. Hey, can you guys open this up to other people? It's like no, but we got we got the authorization to create the U.S. Cyber Range, which is mm -hmm. a separate uh 501 three, uh, 501 c3 nonprofit that uh allows other states to come on board but they ha they have to pay but since we're nonprofit we just it's pay uh, just to break even basically so we don't we're not making a profit on that and then they yeah. they can get accounts on the US cyber range well why is it that there aren't more cyber ranges because um, it's con be the concept sounds there are a few there are yeah. a few um but um several are for profit, so they're very expensive. Um, several, uh, what what a lot of us did in the in the in the security training realm was we used in the old days in the '90s we used classrooms. We had classrooms of machines, and in the late '90s, early '00s, we started using uh, going to, to virtualization. And the in the in the mid 2000, 2010s, we were doing um, you know uh, racks of virtual machines using you know VMware. ESXi and stuff like that, but then that only scales. You can, you know, you have you have two racks full of hard drives, and someone says, "Hey, we want to roll this out statewide." It's like, oh, I need a whole building full of racks, and then you start taking care of physical hardware and blowing up, blowing up power supplies and replacing bad hard drives, and then you're you're focused on the IT and not the content itself. And so we knew when we started the range, we wanted to go and we wanted to abstract ourselves from the hardware, and that's why we went 100% AWS uh, virtual in the cloud. But still, I don't know if, well, it does partially answer my question, but oh, oh, I feel okay, like the, the, to answer cyber your question, ranges, though, like they're so important to the industry and developing mm -hmm. the talent and the training. And that's why I'm kind of questioning. I'm like, why still aren't there more? We know this is so essential, right? It, it did because the technology to layer it on top of uh, the cloud, for example, and that in that manner didn't exist. Um we created some some of the technology. We used several open source tools and put them together in a way, but no one else had done that before. Mm. Um, we modeled ourselves after some of the existing ranges that we had been involved with that we knew didn't quite do it right. Um, when we talk about right, we're talking about infinite scalability. Okay, I can use the term infinite lightly here. It's, nothing's <laughs> infinite when it comes to scalability, but uh, practically, you know, um, you know, teachers will say, "Hey, are you sure? I, I have like a hundred." students are you sure they can all log in at the same time it's like 
it's not a problem. We've got 25,000 online right now. So a hundred, wow. you know, yeah, yeah. It's, it's not, not an issue. So, uh, um, and we knew when we designed this, it would have to be nth level scalable so that we could, uh, uh, instantly spin up, you know, thousands of virtual machines and not, uh, not bog down the system or have any significant bottlenecks. Um, so the, the reason it doesn't exist in this form anywhere else is because, um, you need a team of developers, really dedicated developers to do it. And it would have been very hard to do as a startup on our own because we had to iterate fairly quickly to be able to create a product to do it. And so it really helped having the state kind of kickstart us like that. You really need like the support of a, a numerous organizations, it sounds like. And, or, and uh, or a dedicated team of developers yeah. And, yeah. and engineers, yeah. Um, we talked a while back about um, uncovering vulnerable systems on a network. And you mentioned the Shodan.io and finding something on the <laughs> printer in your office. Could you explain what the tool is and you know what was happening with your printer? <laughs> yeah, so um, I know about Shodan. Shodan is an OSINT tool that uh, basically does a lot of the scan constant security scanning of the internet for you. So uh, now, like any tool it can be used for good or for evil. It's all, it's all how you use it. So the, the same thing here was uh, um, Shodan scans the internet looking for vulnerable systems. Um, I saw our, our printer was spewing out reams of reams of, of paper every weekend. I'm like, what's going on? So I literally looked, looked, looked at the paper and I saw, oh, look, this is an Nmap scan. Oh, look, this is a, <laughs> this is, this is an open email proxy scan. I'm all like, I'm like, What's yeah? The, 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 this system's being being scanned for, um, re, re, you know, see, you know, all the time. So I wonder if it's on Shodan. So I go to Shodan. And sure enough, my, our printer, Virginia Tech printer, is on Shodan because oh, Virginia Tech, by the way, has a re, we're called a research network. We're, we're wide open. There aren't any firewalls really. So right. when you turn on your when you turn on your desktop, you better have that thing locked down because you're going to start getting scanned. Um, so but that's part of it. So the, and I respect that. So uh. I saw that it was on Shodan. I'm like, oh my gosh, our printer's on Shodan. So I, I asked for, for administrative access to that printer and went in there and locked down its own firewall so that it wouldn't allow all these scans and stuff. So yeah, that was that was fun. So what other types of maybe common hardware or software vulnerabilities have you uncovered? Would you say that was like a vulnerability? Um, not, it was not a vulnerability, it was a configuration error. Um, so vulnerability would be actually be, you know, a uh, known or unknown um, piece of code that is vulnerable to being exploited or attacked and leveraged. Um, so I'm sure with the age of that printer, because it's an IoT device and no one patches IoT, right. um, I, I like to tell people the, the S in IoT stands for security which doesn't exist. There's so no it's, it, yeah, there's no S. <laughs> exactly. So people put printers online and they don't think about them again. They put their routers online. They don't think about them again. So I know it hadn't been patched. And so chances are, I know it's running embedded Linux. There's most probably a vulnerability in there. So you definitely want to lock those things down. If you can't uh, patch them, you should, you know, annually, at least annually check for firmware updates and stuff like that. Besides the, the, the printer, um, which was a configuration issue, um, when I worked for um, both the DoD and Rackspace, Rackspace, we worked for Rackspace for 17 years, which is a third major internet hoster, or were until recently. Um, they, uh, um, we would have, you know, thousands and thousands of hosts, uh, servers and data centers uh, all over the world. And we'd have several thousand customers running web servers and DNS servers and things like that. And so we would regularly scan our customers to make sure that they were keeping their stuff safe and because that was their job. Um, and oftentimes they wouldn't. And so one case was uh, we, we scanned our networks. We saw some unusual traffic. So we scanned our networks for vulnerable DNS servers bind. DNS is the, is the, the DNS server of the internet. And so we saw, wow, we've got thousands of vulnerable DNS servers. We really need to proactively take care of this for our customers or our networks are going to turn into a hacker playground. And so, okay, so we sent notifications to the customers and me and a, a team of other engineers um, wrote a set of uh, um, SSH, Python automation scripts for scanning and, and uh, patching each one of those DNS servers. And so we 
you have to communicate with customers and schedule all this stuff and then separate the ones we're patching now from the ones that we're doing later and then automate that um, using using a combination of bash and python um, for patching the systems so patching is of course one of those essential things you know secure passwords patching yes. you know the, the things you hear over and over those are the most common um, weak links other than humans the most common technological weak links in the chain and uh so when, when other people don't do it we would have to do it at rackspace but so those here are the... here I, I, we own this network so we're responsible for everything on the network here at the cyber range right i mean those are the things you should you know always do you know patching in terms of securing your network so how does someone listening to this podcast you know do what you do at your work maybe at their at their home you know besides <laughs> patching different things? How do they make sure their systems are secure? Before you can secure your systems, you have to know what you have. Um, a good way of doing that is to, uh, is to audit your, your home network. Um, when I teach kids to, uh, once we get them to take our ethics class, we teach them then to, uh, um, to scan how to scan their own home network using like Nmap, for example. And so we'll show, look, you do an Nmap scan of, you know, your slash 24 worth of IP space. By the way, if you don't know what slash 24 is, take some networking classes. Learn some networking IT. class, yes. <laughs> yeah, all, all this cybersecurity is great, but it's built on top of IT knowledge. For sure. So that's op operating systems, networks, um, um, and, and general IT, IT knowledge. So um, have kids go home and run an NMAP command, you know, boot up Kali and scan their own home network um, so they can see, wow, I can see a Oh, what's there's a Blu-ray players on my network and my sister's iPad and my parents' laptop and what's this strange device? You'll often see things that you have no idea what they are. And so uh, it's very important to first know what's there and then you can look at each system and make sure it's getting updates and uh, is being patched. So how do you keep up with, you know, all the issues that arise in cybersecurity? Because there's always, you know, new vulnerabilities that could be found with new hardware and software. There's always things that they end up finding that were initially yeah. there to begin with, uh, or they were there, they just, people uncovered them. So how do you, how do you stay, you know, in the uh, know? Kind of abreast of all that. Yeah. yeah. The, um, there are various ways um, following the CVEs, the, the common vulnerabilities and exploits um, databases um, to make sure that you're no, you know of any uh, critical uh, critical vulnerabilities that are known of. Um, so a lot of times I'll just join mailing lists that talk about the, the important stuff. So I don't monitor CVE directly, but the, um, um, I like to, I like several morning kind of news digest. Um, Krebs on security is a really good one. He's the same guy who, you know, consults with Congress and, and makes recommendations to, uh, to international organizations on securing their systems. He's the one who really first documented um, credit card skimming um, at gas pumps and stuff like that. So he he covers a wide um, a wide array of different topics. Um, also, there's a couple email newsletters, uh, mail lists I subscribe to. Um, uh, there's one called T, uh, uh, TLDR, um, which is a little summary of stuff going on in IT and DevOps worlds. Um, so, so new newsletters and things like that are really useful. These are all things that would be free and open for anyone else to come in mm -hmm. and look up to, right? Awesome. Pretty, pretty much. Yeah. What, um, what skills do you think you need to be successful to keep, you know, keep moving forward in the cyber pathway or that make you, you know, just be successful in it in general? Yeah. The, um, um, people sometimes introduce me as an expert, but. I never introduce myself. I'm not, I'm not an expert. I'm always learning. I tell, I tell kids, especially the more, the more I learn, or I tell college, college students, cause they're, they're like, oh, I took this class. I know this. It's like, dude, the more you learn, the dumber you should feel. So <laughs> it really is because the more you learn, the more you realize you're just scratching the surface. And so I guess the more surfaces you can scratch, the wider your knowledge, knowledge pool gets, but you need to go deeper too. And that's where the intimate knowledge of, of IT and networking and operating systems are kind of the underpinnings. You can take your security plus certification, but it's just a bunch of acronyms if you don't know what's really underneath it. And so knowing what's underneath it um, is more experience, uh, more, more important. I 
tell uh, I would tell um, students that are going for interviews um, certs are okay but it's like one leg of a three-legged stool it's like you have certs uh, experience is what I first look for first experience degree and cert if you have all three of those you're a perfect candidate if you have one of them okay you can kind of wobble around if you have two of them that's better <laughs> but if you have three <laughs> if you have three then you're rock solid so but that that experience should be in like you know set up a home network um, you know, set up some Raspberry Pis if you can find them on the market now. Um, set up a <laughs> basic Linux box. Um, you know, dual boot from Windows, Windows only to Windows and 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 uh, and um, Ubuntu or something, or make Linux your daily driver operating system. So you're mm-hmm. in it and learning it. That's it. It's that edgy thing. That's like, oh, I'm afraid of that. Hey, you can still run Windows on a virtual machine and run your Outlook and other tools. Um, so jump into it. I remember the first my first day at Rackspace was a. Uh, they gave me a, you want to run one Red Hat Linux or you want to run Windows 98. And I'm like, ah, I could probably be more productive on Windows 98. I'll take 98. And I put it in, put the CD-ROM in and and um, pulled it out the wrong time. And it, oh, this back when they had CDs, right? Yeah. And I, and I pulled it out <laughs> and broke the disk in half. And I was like, oh, no. And it was that was very uh, kind of foreshadowing of my future that I was done with Windows, basically. Like, you know what? <laughs> it's time for me to jump into, into Linux anyway. And they're like, that was our only install media. So you're up you're, you're running red hat i'm like that's fine and that, that was really telling for me that was really good because it was good for me because it forced me to jump into what i really wanted to do anyway which was get away from the windows world so no no ding on windows but you know kind of sucks yeah i'm gonna you know definitely snap <laughs> snap and clap about you know running linux linux and trying linux though because i feel like that's definitely helped me um even with my system better. I was like, Oh my gosh, I can do this better on Linux than I can with a mouse. Why would you like, exactly. Why would you even do that? I have a lot of students say, why are you always on the, on the command line on, on the keyboard? And it's like, it's just more efficient. You know, if I have to find some file that I had like five years ago, I can use the find command and I've got it like that versus hunting and clicking with a mouse and a UI for five or 10 minutes. It's like, exactly. It's just a waste of time. It makes sense. I yeah. hope we will evangelize future generations <laughs> to yeah. try the same thing. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll wave that flag on occasion. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time, Thomas. We had so much fun talking today. Sure, Jim. And in a second, you and I will go through this week's episode challenge together. Ooh, fun. <laughs>